Thank you so much for that very, very gracious uh, introduction, for the warm welcome that I have received here at Northeastern University. I'm thrilled to receive an honorary degree from Northeastern University. And I was delighted to receive and to accept President Ayum's invitation to address the Northeastern University School of Law class of 2012 and to receive this honorary degree. It's difficult, uh, one of your classmates said that as she stood here, it's quite a feeling. Both of your classmates actually said that, and it is quite a feeling. This is the first time I've ever been in a hockey arena. <laughs> It's also, um, I'm also very struck by the fact, I'll share with some and perhaps others are familiar with this practice, but across the South, particularly among African American communities, for so long, the basic dignity of being called by a title, if one had a title, or older people being called Mr. and Mrs., as was the custom and the practice, for white adults was often denied to black adults during the Jim Crow era. And one of the byproducts of that practice has been a custom that still exists in some parts of the country where people with degrees and sometimes people without degrees but people who people respect are called doctor. So for years when I would travel in the South on behalf of the Legal Defense Fund or the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights under law, some of my clients would call me Dr. Berrien. So I thank you, Northeastern, for making an honest woman out of me. <laughs> so many men and women I have long respected and admired and learned so much from, including two Emeritus Director's Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, Julius Chambers and Elaine Jones, as well as the late Judge A. Leon Kingenbotham, and so many others have received honorary degrees from this law school. So this occasion is especially meaningful to me. Others have recognized the family, friends, and loved ones who are in the room, and that is appropriate. But I suspect I am not the only one who is also remembering family who are not in the room because they are now deceased. But I know that my parents, like any of you who may have people who have gone on, but who helped to get you where you are today, are watching from heavenly box seats. I'm very blessed today to be joined by my best friend, my husband of 25 years, Peter Williams. And I also want to briefly acknowledge three people in the audience who encouraged me in my pursuit of a legal education and public interest legal career and have been unfailingly supportive throughout the 25 plus years I've known them. Thank you, Jamie Hoyt, Ann Josephson, and Dolph Vanderpoel. And finally, while a faculty like this um, would undoubtedly include many friends to me and to others who have worked long in public interest. I would be remiss if I didn't especially acknowledge my dear friend and a former law school roommate who is a member of this faculty, Professor Hope Lewis. I promise you, class of 2012, it does not seem like that long since we were sitting there but you are the reminder that indeed it's been a while. <laughs> as great of an honor as this is, I'm also acutely aware, keenly aware, that I am one of the last obstacles standing between you and your diplomas. <laughs> and I assure you that if I've learned nothing else, it's that I shouldn't spend very long in such a precarious position. In a little while, okay, let's be honest, perhaps already, Champagne corks have popped, tassels are moved, balloons released, fancy meals eaten to celebrate your law school graduation. But for some, indeed perhaps for most members of the class of 2012, the celebrations may be short-lived. As you've already been reminded, and as I vividly remember, bar review awaits. 
As happy as you are to see your loved ones in the audience, you may be worrying about the job market right now or worrying about student loans. But I want to encourage you, and I can say this from the standpoint of survival, do not allow these bullies to steal your joy today or any other day. Do not allow trepidation to overshadow the excitement and high hopes for the future that you have earned through years of hard work in law school. A past recipient of the honorary degree from this law school, Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm said it best when she said, every tomorrow has two handles. We can take hold of the handle of anxiety or the handle of faith. The choice is ours. I encourage you today to hold on as tightly as you possibly can to the handle of faith and to run in the other direction from the handle of anxiety. It may seem to be difficult to follow this advice in this time because to borrow a concept stated so eloquently by the Apostle Paul, the essence of faith is the ability to be certain about things that you cannot see and confident that in years to come you will reach a point that is invisible or at least obscure to you today. At times, it may feel like you're traveling around a blind curve on a two-lane highway with little to protect you from the possibility that a car could be passing into your lane on the road ahead. Those are the times that call for faith. Despite what you might imagine when you hear about life experiences of people who have done things that you would like to do or have followed paths that are similar to the ones you hope to pursue, I assure you that it is only in retrospect and with the benefit of the 2020 vision of hindsight that life presents itself so neatly and appears as meticulously arranged as is outlined in our bios and our resumes and our curricula vita. As blessed as I have been throughout my life, and I have been truly blessed, I want you to know that things have not always gone according to plan. And it's okay. In fact, I am better for it. And time after time, I've discovered that the detours and the diversions from the route that I planned for myself, like the unexpected surprise of a spectacular place that you can only see if you exit the highway and make your way to a back road, have been the source of some of the most memorable, rewarding, and important moments of my life. You heard, for example, that I spent a great deal of my career at the Legal Defense Fund. But what you may not know is that my first two attempts to get a job as a Legal Defense Fund attorney were unsuccessful. You heard that I worked for the Ford Foundation. But you may not know that before I was hired there, I was considered for two other positions and rejected both times. The truth is, anyone who has achieved any measure of success in any aspect of life, has had setbacks, has had moments of doubt, has encountered detours and diversions along the road. Throughout law school and for much of my legal career, I mistakenly believed that the commitment to excellence that got me there and got me through was and should be perfectionism. And I would have been reluctant to acknowledge my failures before an audience this large, or perhaps to anyone, including myself, and I was worse for it. I want to encourage you to get past that immediately, because the sooner you get past that, the more you will be able to learn, and the more fearlessly you will be able to walk in the world and to go on and to pursue every dream that you have today and will have in the future. The late Steve Jobs said that being fired turned out to be one of the most positive developments in his life. It's hard to imagine a greater success in the corporate sphere. President Barack Obama lost a congressional race before mounting successful campaigns for the U.S. Senate and the President of the United States. He was able to make history despite losing a race. And in his wonderful memoir, A Reason to Believe, Governor Deval Patrick who received an honorary degree from this law school in 2002, had this to say about the importance of moving beyond setbacks. 
Everyone, especially young people, must learn that their ideals need not be casualties of their confrontations with reality. I have had my setbacks and outright failures like anyone else, but I have managed to avoid the apathy, pessimism, and even immobilizing sadness that so often come in the wake of struggle. Idealism is an act of will, to be sure, but we are all up to it and nothing of any lasting value happens without it. One of the things that will allow you to see beyond any setbacks you may encounter and push past any rejection you might have received or may receive in the future is never losing sight of the opportunity and responsibility that you have to serve. As you celebrate your graduation from law school today, I urge you to redouble your resolve to use the excellent education that you've received here to make a positive difference in the lives of other people every single day. On April 21st, 1965, shortly after Bloody Selma in Selma, Alabama, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. addressed more than 1,000 lawyers at the Association of the Bar of the City of New York in a speech entitled, The Civil Rights Struggle in the United States Today. Dr. King reminded the overflow crowd that members of the legal profession have both a unique opportunity and special responsibility to use their education and training to make a positive difference in the world. That's you. Dr. King said, I must confess that I hesitated before accepting the Bar Association's invitation. I have mixed, almost schizophrenic feelings about lawyers. I have appeared many times in criminal courts. I have served time. I've had considerable first-hand brushes with lawyers on the bench and before it. I was told the other day that my close associates, the Reverend Ralph Abernathy and the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth and I, are among the best clients of the Legal Defense Fund. I assume, because it could not be otherwise, that our description as best clients was earned by our volume of cases as opposed to fee collections. I would be less than candid if I did not admit that my associations with counsel for the opposition were not always pleasant. My mixed feelings stem from the fact that notwithstanding the aforementioned wounds, as you lawyers say, I have a deep and abiding admiration for the legal profession and the tremendous role it has played in the service of the cause of civil rights. Your profession should be proud of its contributions. You should be aware, as indeed I am, that the road to freedom is now a highway because lawyers throughout the land, yesterday and today, have helped clear the obstructions, have helped eliminate the roadblocks, by their selfless, courageous espousal of difficult and unpopular causes. For every noted hero, there have been hundreds who have labored humbly and anonymously in the vineyard of freedom. I do not know whether your career will be one that will make headlines or whether you will be one of the people who is on the sidelines making a difference. But you can be sure that either way, the important, the important thing, the most important thing, is that you are making a difference. As students and now graduates of this law school, you have been exposed to core values that include educating lawyers who are concerned about injustice and mindful of opportunities to address it. You are or should be no strangers to the ideals and values that Dr. King, Dr. King spoke about. But I've shared his message with you today to challenge and hopefully inspire you to make the commitment to public service and social justice that were integral to your law school experience an integral part of your life as a lawyer. You will never be sorry for it. Last month in Washington, I was part of another group of a thousand lawyers. The occasion was different, of course, and the time was different. The occasion was a memorial service for the sixth director counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, a tremendous attorney named John Payton, who is known to members of your faculty and to many lawyers across the country. Before his appointment as one of Thurgood Marshall's successors at the Legal Defense Fund, John's legal career included service as a law clerk to a federal district judge 
partnership in one of the country's most prestigious law firms, William ha Wilmer Hale, service as a corporation counsel for the District of Columbia, and teaching at Harvard and Howard Law Schools. In addition to that, he donated his time and provided financial support to many nonprofit organizations. He secured pro bono representation for anti-apartheid protesters during the Free South Africa Movement, served on the boards of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law and the DC Bar Foundation, and was an independent election monitor when President Nelson Mandela was elected in South Africa. He argued before the United States Supreme Court in several important civil rights cases. But behind the scenes, he made the time to be a mentor and advisor to countless lawyers he worked with over the years. And I consider myself very fortunate to have been one of them. Several months before he learned that he was suffering from a terminal illness, John was interviewed by his law school alumni magazine. His message, like Dr. King's address to the New York City Bar Association, will hopefully inspire you as you graduate and throughout your legal career. John said, no matter what you do in your career, you can still do things that help advance issues of social justice and racial justice. That includes pro bono service and financially supporting causes you believe in, but there are also things you can do outside of your job, becoming involved in your communities in ways that matter, becoming involved in how your school system works, and striving to make it better, making sure that our civic culture is healthy. Members of the class of 2012, no matter what path your career may take, you have the opportunity and responsibility to serve. You can do it in any of the ways that John described. You can do it by mentoring a child or a young man or woman who is trying to figure out where they are called to serve and how they can get there, perhaps as you have been as a student. And you can do it by ensuring that however you make a living, you commit at least a portion of your time, talent, and treasure to help others without regard to their ability to pay you. Northeastern Law School has trained you to be discontent with injustice, and it has prepared you well to be a force for positive change. I know that you can, and I expect that you will, make great contributions wherever you go from here. My heartfelt congratulations to all of you, and in the words of St. Ignatius Loyola, Go forth and set the world on fire.